platform we call it Teh Tarik Talk yang berlangsung setiap uh, minggu kedua hari Jumaat. Okay, second Friday of every month. So book your calendar. Uh, so today uh, it depends on the topic at hand, and you know uh, uh, it, the fact is that we want people to be excited over this course. You know, on something uh, very intellectual, very relevant, and you don't have to have a very uh, stiff. Uh, apa ni uh, uh, context to do that so that's why we create data rate talk now as usual sebelum kita mulakan apa data rate wonder is it <laughs> data rate wonder okay maknanya data rate satu give give a big uh, a hands of applause to our uh, ni uh, data rate wonder data rate satu come here it's a show Saya rasa sangat uh, beruntung lah bertuah sebab together we we uh, today we have a, a very uh, apa ni a, a writer that that is quite popular in his home country. He comes from London. He's been in the, in the US and now he is based in Malaysia. Uh, a little bit about him, Mr. Uh, Imran Ahmad. Okay, he actually uh, grew up in in London, so he will be bringing. Uh, a true British slang to us today, Mr. Imran. Uh, he uh, studied at Stirling University in Scotland. Uh, he uh, has worked with various uh, corporations, big uh, global corporations such as Unilever uh, and many other companies. And uh, uh, in his busy time, he managed to come up with a book. I think something that that everybody has to emulate, you know, writing a book. I was trying to do that last time. I managed to write a few paragraphs of, of my blog. Okay, that's about it. All right, so uh, he has appeared uh, in many uh, platforms that include the BBC Television, Sky Television, SBS Television Australia, Voice of America, Press TV, National Public Radio, BBC Radio, Radio Australia, ABC Radio, and now, he has the YIM platform, okay? <laughs> so, without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Imran Ahmad. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Imran Ahmad. And I'd like to start by uh, saying thank you for coming. I really appreciate that you came. You have no idea how grateful I am that you came. You see, the very first time that I was ever did anything like this, uh, my book had just been published. It had already been out for just a few days, and already it had nearly sold a copy. And I was asked to give a talk at Borders in Islington, which is in North London. And it was on uh, Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. So I showed up at 7 p.m. And I had a very bad feeling about this because there was no poster or anything up about my talk. Unlike here in Cyberjaya, where I've seen these everywhere. <laughs> but they had laid out 40 chairs. <clears throat> and there was a very good sign. There was a woman already sitting there half an hour early, staking out her place. So that was a very good sign. Until she got up and wandered away. And I realized that she was just someone who was looking at a book and she wanted somewhere to sit. So 7.30 came and there was nobody there. Nobody at all. So it was a very big Borders and it had a coffee shop. So they got on the loudspeaker. They said, this evening in Borders, we have Imran Ahmed, the author of, blah, blah. And then he read from the, the book jacket and he made it sound so boring. Even I didn't want to be there. 
<laughs> but they managed to get an audience, and so I began. But it was a horrible experience. The audience were completely miserable. They didn't laugh at any of my jokes. Only one member of the audience sat at the front, and the other one sat right at the back. So that's why I'm very grateful that you came. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. And can you understand me okay? Yes. Good, because you know, I don't take it for granted anymore that I'm understood. Because we often, we can make a mistake if we think that other people are understanding us or have the same understanding of some concept in the same way that we do. That can be a mistake <clears throat> called an assumption. Let me give you an example. When I first uh, came to KL about three years ago, after a few weeks I needed a haircut. So I went to a barber shop. Now it was an old Malaysian gentleman and he didn't seem to speak much English. But I thought, that doesn't matter. I will use the principle of universal archetypes. Those things which are universally understood. So I said to him, have you seen a James Bond movie? He said, James Bond, yes, yes. I said, good. I will have a standard James Bond, please. He said, yes, okay. So I got in the chair and I settled back. And you know, I was pretty tired. So I, I kind of closed my eyes and I drifted off. And before I knew it, he'd shaved off all my hair. I said, what the hell are you doing? Don't you know who James Bond is? He said, yes. Man with cat. Excuse me. So we must be very careful about making assumptions that other people have the same understanding of a particular concept that we do. Anyway, um, I made that story up, fortunately, because you can see everything's fine. But um, everything else I tell you today is completely true. Everything else is, is completely true. So, oh, and by the way, I must tell you, I, I actually, this talk I'm giving you is a variation of a talk I developed uh, for an American audience, in which I delivered all over America in about 50 cities. I drove around America over two months, last summer actually, and so anyway, this was a talk um, I developed uh, for an American audience. I, I delivered all over America, um, about 50 cities. So just bear in mind that when I'm giving this talk, imagine that you're actually American, and you live in some small town, and you've never met a Muslim, okay? That, bear that in mind. You're American, you've never met a Muslim, and all you know about Muslims is what you've seen on the television. So that's kind of how, what I developed this, this talk for. So when I was a boy, uh, I knew I wanted to be a writer, and I imagined how great it would be to, um, to have written a book that lots of people had read. But I didn't do anything about it. Um, I studied chemistry at university, which I really didn't enjoy. And then I started my corporate career, uh, in finance, which, in, uh, which I really didn't enjoy. And yet, to be honest, I wasn't any good at chemistry or finance. Uh, but it seems we go through life, we go through life doing what we think we, we ought to do rather than what we would like to do. So for some reason, we feel that what we'd like to do, we can't do, we mustn't do. Um, there are so many good reasons why we mustn't do what we'd like to do. And it's taken me many decades to finally figure out, hey, I can do what I'd like to do, and I'm doing it now. It's quite hot up here. Anyway, <clears throat> when, I was, uh, when I was a boy, there was no issue of Islam and the West. In those days, the issue was uh, the godless communists. And I was very happy to see um, America working with many Muslim countries, especially Pakistan, to drive the godless communists out of Afghanistan. I was very happy in that world. I was growing up in, um, in England. And I was very happy in that world because nobody would mistake me for a godless communist. Um, and my self-perception of Muslims in those days when I was growing up is that we were, really, we were just really boring people because we just prayed all the time and we didn't drink and we didn't go to parties. Well, we didn't get invited to the really good parties. And we weren't supposed to have sex unless we got married, but that was okay because our food was really good. Anyway, in those days, there was, no, there was no Islam in the West, it was the godless communists. And I was quite happy that I was on the same side as James Bond and the six million dollar man. Which actually seems very cheap by today's standards. 
and I discovered that I had a, I actually had a connection with James Bond. I discovered when I started reading the, uh, the actual James Bond novels by Ian Fleming. And he's very precise. He gives a very precise description of James Bond. So this is an actual description of James Bond taken from uh, the novels by Ian Fleming. He had a dark, clean-cut face, eyes wide and level, straight, rather long black brows, hair black, parted on the left, longish straight nose, wide and finely drawn but cruel mouth. Well, my mouth can be cruel if I try. Okay, it does say it, jaw straight and firm. It does say he had a three-inch scar on the right cheek, which I don't have, but there is a dimple on the chin on the right side. But anyway, when I read this description, especially it said that he had black hair parted on the left and a long straight nose and a dark face, I thought, well, hang on a minute. That's a perfect description of me. <laughs> Ian Fleming is describing me. That means I'm not that different from James Bond. Okay, apart from the vodka, the cigarettes and the women. But apart from that, uh, I'm not that different from James Bond, which means that I belong, because James Bond was the ultimate establishment figure, and I just wanted to belong. Growing up in uh, British society, I didn't want to be different, I just wanted to belong. And I thought, well, if I'm not that different from James Bond, then I belong. Um, but then a couple of things happened. <clears throat> First of all, the godless communists became capitalists, and now they they, they come to England and they buy our soccer teams, our football teams. So they've, pretty, they've joined the West, they're no longer the enemy. And I remember the famous American writer, Gore Vidal, saying in the late 80s, uh, very, very late 80s, he said, um, he said there was now a vacuum. You see, there was, the, the communists were no longer the enemy, so there was a vacuum. The military industrial complex cannot stand a vacuum. And that, that just changed everything. That uh, turned the world upside down and you know, it was a horrible event. But it suddenly, it seemed that in, after that event there was a sudden hysteria and the world was now being viewed as Islam and the West. It seems that there was this hysterical notion that there was something called Islam and it was out to get, out to get the West, whatever that is. And in that post 9-11 hysteria, um, a lot of what I call dehumanization and lazy tribalism was taking place. And that's when you take your revenge out on anybody that you can associate with the actual guilty party. It doesn't have to be the guilty party. It can be anyone that reminds you in some way of the guilty party. Shakespeare describes this very well in Julius Caesar. So Caesar was very popular with the, with the people and he was assassinated. He was. Um, uh, stabbed by some conspirators, including Brutus and Cinna. And people were very angry because uh, Caesar was very popular and crowds went out looking for revenge. And a crowd came upon Cinna the poet. And um, even though it was very clear to the crowd that Cinna the poet was not Cinna the conspirator, they killed him anyway because he had the same name. And this is what I call lazy tribalism. This is what um, happens when people just take out their vengeance on anyone that they can associate with the actual guilty party. And you know what? We've been doing it for thousands of years and we still do it. Okay. In the um, post 9-11 world, there was suddenly this projection of the world as Islam versus the West. And there were very extreme views on what that actually meant. Now, I knew there was no such thing as Islam, as a unified entity. I know that. And I knew that there was no such thing as the West, as a unified entity, because I, I lived there, and I knew that they, everyone wasn't the same, as it were. But the world is being presented in this way as, as Islam versus the West, and certain um, elements were driving that deliberately on both sides, because it suits their agenda. It suits their agenda to, um, to define the whole world as Islam versus the West. So, what does this Islam versus the West look like? Um, so, when you look at, when I looked at how Muslims were being projected, presented in the West by, say, Fox News and so on, um, you know, the data was wasn't very um, 
brought what I consider representative, but it was all accurate. It was all authentic data. So what do we know about them? We know that they are pirates. I mean, they are terrorists and bombers. They're bombs in their shoes and bombs in their underpants. And they are uh, pirates as well, quite good looking ones, but pirates nonetheless. And they are um, uh, religious fanatics and they want to take over the world. And when they're not doing all the terrorism, then they're oppressing women. That's their full-time hobby to oppress women. So if you put all this together and you, the images are all authentic, the images are all real. You can't say that they're made up. They're not false images, they are real images. So if you put all of that together, a perfectly reasonable conclusion is that uh, Muslims are terrorists and fanatics who oppress women and want to destroy the West. And that's a perfectly reasonable conclusion based on that authentic data. And the data is authentic. No one can say those pictures are not real. They are real. How might um, the West look when it's being represented by people, for example, Al-Qaeda, who don't have the interests of the, West, the Western mind as well? So if you imagine that you live in a, a village in a, Afghanistan, perhaps, or in Iraq, and you've never met an American, never had a real interaction with an American, and um, this is the data that's presented to you. Listen, let me tell you about America. They are, they are brutal in the way they deal with other people, and they are religious fanatics, and they hate our religion, and they, hate, they insult our prophet, and so on. They want to burn our holy book, and their, their, their behavior is so immoral, you can't believe it, and they flaunt it. They aren't even ashamed of it, and they interfere all over the world. They interfere, and they, they even talk about it in their own newspapers. They don't even hide it that they interfere around the world, even against their own laws. And they are uh, torturing and oppressing our brothers and sisters in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. So it's obvious that America, the West, especially America, hates Islam and wants to oppress and kill all Muslims. That's a, a very valid conclusion based on that data. That's perfectly, it's all real. The pictures are all real, and that's a perfectly valid conclusion based on that data. But the question is, what if this data, although it's all real, isn't necessarily the whole picture? What if it's not actually the whole picture? What if the whole picture, the bigger picture is slightly different? What if, uh, in fact, America does have compassion? And what if, America isn't actually out to beat the, the Afghan people and oppress them, and actually wants them to have a functioning society with education and healthcare and so on. Perhaps that might be the case. What if um, America doesn't go around invading the world all the time, but actually tries to help in places where there's no oil and so on, and it's just these people who work for the Peace Corps, they are really decent people. They're, they don't do it for the money, and they don't do it for the oil, and they, they put their lives at risk, and they go to places which don't have any strategic value, and they really do good work. And sometimes when America interferes, we're really glad that America interfered. We wanted America to interfere, or as someone, someone had to do something, and sometimes it's only America that bothers. Nobody did anything for the Bosnian Muslims except America, and it wasn't even their business. There's no oil in Bosnia. There's nothing. Nobody came in. America went and, and prevented that genocide. A bit late, maybe, but better late than never. And it's not necessarily true that Americans hate all Americans hate all Muslims. There's so much decency in America and so much positive feeling that's demonstrated to Muslims and also sometimes to uh, America's mistreatment of them um, that it would be unfair to say that Americans hate Muslims. So if you put all that together, sorry. So I would suggest that the bigger picture is looks somewhat different from the the picture you get if you just choose the, the, the bad data, the, the pictures that look really bad, and that the bigger picture is much more complex. Now, when I gave one of these talks in America, one of my uh, audience members said um, that she used to work for CNN, and she was based in Egypt. And she said that they had a policy that they would only show, um, that, that they would never show a normal person on camera. They would never show an ordinary Muslim on camera. They would always go out and find the most angry, um, outraged, dangerous looking, threatening Muslim that they could find, and that's who they would show on camera. Then that was their actual policy. They would never show ordinary people on camera. So if that's the image, if they select the data like that, and that's all that they, pre they, they project, 
then it's no surprise that, Muslim, that Americans and Western people who've never met a Muslim have these negative views because the data that they get is deliberately selected to, to give them that view. So let's, what about those Muslims again? So let's look at some authentic, what I consider authentic and representative pictures of Muslims. Now actually it can be quite disturbing. For example, uh, we remember the conclusion we had um, from based on the data, the Muslim to crazes and so on, but I saw this and I thought, that's not me. That doesn't represent me. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a bomber. I don't have a bomb in my underpants. There's a rocket maybe, but it hardly ever works anymore. Um, and I don't oppress women. You know, they walk all over me. So, yeah, let's look at some more authentic data. Um, because I think that, that that data the people get is actually only a fraction of the overall picture. So, for example, now here we have a typical Muslim family. Clearly, the man rules by the sword, and the, his violent attitude is also in the, in the boy. Clearly a typical Muslim family, and this is what they're really like. Okay, I'm just kidding. Let's go. I mean, the, the actual data of what Muslims are, they do, they shop, they do aerobics, soccer fans, St. John's Ambulance, these are the images that people never see on Fox News and CNN. And um, they dress up as superheroes and play the bagpipes and buy ice cream for their children and so on. I'm not entirely convinced by the Santa Claus, but that is an authentic picture. I, I did take it. And um, they even do karaoke. That's my boss. He makes us do karaoke. It's really, really impressive because I can't sing at all. Um, and now these Malaysian policewomen, they don't look oppressed to me, not at all. Um, in fact, if I was going to be arrested, to be honest, I would much rather be in Indonesia. <laughs> that would definitely be my preference. Anyway, and, and all of these Muslim women, uh, they don't look oppressed to me, an astronaut, Baroness and Chairman of the Conservative Party in the UK, nanotechnologist, Queen, proud American doctor, and so on. These are all very, very different women, but none of them look oppressed to me. Um, and there's an interesting uh, phenomenon also in, in the US right now that uh, free medical clinics are being um, created by Muslims uh, as a way of doing charity works in the community. But the right-wing anti-Islamic bloggers and so on are saying that this is actually a sinister plot to take over America by stealth. But you see, anything can be misrepresented. Anything can be represented however you want. For example, that's a terrorist training camp. These people are fanatics, and these people are preparing for war. OK? OK, so, um, so how did uh, the post-9-11 world affect me personally? Well, it was in my travels to the United States, actually. Um, see, I used to, I, I, I was based in London, I worked for General Electric, and I used to go to America all the time on business. And I, I loved going to America. I always loved arriving and going, um, going off to have something to eat in Red Lobster and going doing all the shopping. Because, you know, the shopping in America is really cheap and, and great. Um, but after 9-11, I began to hear stories about uh, Muslims arriving in the US and being interrogated for hours and so on. And I began to be afraid of going to America. I was afraid. But nothing actually happened to me until about one year after 9-11. It was October 2002. And I arrived in Atlanta from London and it was my 77th arrival in the United States. 77th. And uh, I came into Atlanta, and for the very first time ever, I was sent to secondary. So what is secondary? Well, it's another room, and it has these chairs laid out, and there's these people, all these people sitting there looking tired and afraid and worried and, and so on, and I had to sit there as well. And what had happened was that they had a new process that they just developed with all this new equipment. There was a... Uh, digital cameras and retina scanners and fingerprint uh, scanners and so on and they had to take me through this process so, so, so I was assigned um, a blonde woman, INS officer, immigration officer, to take me through the process but she'd never used the equipment before so another, ma another person, a man came along to help her to sh show her how to use the equipment 
but then she just wandered off and let him do it which is a bit unfortunate because I thought she was really attractive or there may have been the uniform the gun and the handcuffs anyway so he takes me through the process he takes my fo digital photo and uh, retina scan and fingerprint scan then he asks me all these questions uh, where were your parents born uh, how tall are you what did you study at university? Which, as I told you, was chemistry. It's a good thing it wasn't nuclear physics. <laughs> anyway, so he took me through all of this, these questions, all these endless questions. Oh, I'm, but I must tell you that, um, that, that they were actually really polite. He, he was actually very polite and friendly and so on. And it wasn't anything like I thought it would be. Like I'd, I'd heard, assumed it would be from all the, the stories I'd heard. You see, I thought they were going to ask me things like, tell us the location of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> How the hell should I know? I haven't heard from him in nearly a month. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I went through this process and it took two hours. It was two hours before I got out and got, went to get my baggage, which was off the belt and it was just standing by itself, my suitcase. I could see it from half a mile away in the baggage hall. Um, and I was really upset by this. Uh, it, it, it had never happened to me before. And I was really upset how the world had changed. Anyway, this happened to me every time I arrived in the US. Every time I arrived, um, I'd be sent to secondary. I remember once when I, I was going to Richmond, Virginia, and I came into Atlanta and I had a four hour layover <coughs> before my connection. Now, I, I got in the habit of always coming into Atlanta because um, I got the feeling that the immigration people, the, the INS, the Homeland Security people in Atlanta, they got to know me and I got to know them. So they knew it was me, so it was just routine when we did the, the process. But um, I came into Atlanta, went up to the first desk and there was a, a pleasant young African-American woman at the desk and she scanned my passport and she, said, and she read her screen and she said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to send you to secondary. I said, that's okay, it happens all the time. She said, get out of here. I said, no, it's true, it happens all the time. She said, get out of here. And um, what she was meaning by this was not that I should get out, literally, but what she, she was just being surprised. She was showing her surprise that the system was telling her that she had to send me to secondary. Because normally it's the officer's discretion. The officer makes a judgment, asks you a few questions, weighs you up, and the officer decides whether you should go to secondary or not. But in this case, the system was telling her that she had to send me to secondary, and she was surprised by that. Because look, you know what she was thinking? Let's be honest, what she was thinking? She was thinking, he looks harmless and cute. <laughs> anyway, so I went to secondary, I knew where it was, and I was assigned this, um, immigration officer, about 60 years old, and he, I think he was Hawaiian, and he looked just like Chin Ho from Hawaii Five-0. And he was ever so nice, he was so friendly and nice and, and, and very kind and decent, but he took me through the process, took my digital photo, and my fingerprint scan and the retina scan, then he asked me all the same old questions, how tall are you, where were your parents born, I don't think that's changed, I haven't grown any since the last time, and what do you study at university? Well, still chemistry, I haven't been back. You know, there was one question they always asked me, and I, I could never bring myself to tell the actual truth. So I would always discount the answer. They would ask me how much I weighed and I would take off 20%. <laughs> anyway, um, by the time he was done and he had to get authorization from Washington and so on, um, he, he quickly let me out and I ran to the other gate uh, where my plane was, and I just managed to get on, get, get on before the gate closed, before they closed again. I was the last person on the plane, and that was with a four hour layover. So I was beginning to think, wow, how much time do I have to allow to not be stressed about getting my connection? And um, that's how it, it, the world had become. Now, the strangest thing happened actually, um, after Obama was elected, I don't, I don't know if this is related or not, but the first time I arrived in the United States after Obama was elected, I had actually written a book as well. And I'd also reached a certain age threshold. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but I heard there was also an age threshold. And if you were over a certain age, they thought you were harmless. You, know, they weren't, you weren't that much of a threat. So I'd all th three things happened. Obama was elected, I, I wrote a book, and I was above the age threshold. I came into uh, Chicago that time and there was a, a young Hispanic woman and um, she asked me who I was and I told her and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm doing a, a speaking tour uh, of the US. She, said, she asked me who, then who I was and I put my book on the counter. It was actually this one. And, and she looks at the cover and she said, oh, cute picture. Uh, and then she read my, the bio, you know, they have on the back the bio. And then she said, um, then she stamped my passport and said, welcome to the United States. 
So the moral of the story is this. If you are a terrorist and you want to get in, just publish a book. <laughs> so anyway, I was very troubled by this post 9-11 world of these, this false concept of something called Islam, something called the West out to get each other. For me that was a false it was a false perspective because I knew there was no such thing as Islam as a unified entity. I knew there was no such thing as the West as a singular entity. And they weren't really opposed to each other. They both existed across a very broad spectrum. And I knew this because I lived my whole life um, in the Western world. I, I was born in Pakistan, grew up in London. I was a Muslim growing up in a Western country. And I never felt that this opposition, the way that it was being proje proje uh, projected. So I knew I could do something about it. I knew I could write a book which I felt human, rehumanized um, Muslims uh, to the West and the West to Muslims I, because I lived my life in both worlds. Um, the trouble is I'm very lazy and I didn't do anything about it. Could, could you imagine how much work it is to write a whole book? I mean, you know how much work it is to write an essay, right? right? So imagine writing a hundred essays or, or however many it would take to make a whole book. So writing a whole book is just so much work and I just couldn't be bothered. Uh, because it would be so much work. Then I read a book um, on creative visualization. Who's heard of creative visualization? Okay, nobody, right? But in California, they all put their hands up, you know, because they're all Americans are into this. It's a bit like law of attraction. So basically, I read this book and it says basically you, you visualize what you want, you visualize it, you imagine it, you meditate on it, and then you can make it happen. So I thought, okay, I'll try it. So I just, I'll try it, I'll try it. So I, I followed the instructions in the book. I said, I'm a successful published author. Um, I've written a best-selling book. Um, I really, really, really tried it, but the book just wouldn't appear. I just couldn't get it to materialize. In the end, I thought, I might as well just write the book myself. Okay, so then I read a book called The Alchemist. Who's heard of The Alchemist? Come on, somebody must have heard of The Alchemist. Okay, so in The Alchemist, there's the back, excellent. So in The Alchemist, he says, and the Alchemist is a really wonderful book, and it's actually very, very nice about Islam as well. It's actually references to Islam, very, very positive in, in The Alchemist. Um, it's sort of set in an Islamic country, kind of Islamic background. Anyway, um, in The Alchemist, it says that as soon as you start to do your life's work, as soon as you start to do what you're supposed to do, then everything will, the universe will conspire with you to make it happen. Everything will fall into place. If you're doing the right thing, everything will work. And if you're doing the wrong thing, then nothing will work because you're going the wrong way. <coughs> So I thought, well, why don't I just write that book I've been meaning to write? I mean, I've been thinking about it for so long, but I just haven't done it yet. So I opened my laptop computer and I opened a Word document and I started writing. And I wrote for about 30 minutes. Then I read what I'd written and I thought, well, that's not bad. And I quite enjoyed that. So I carried on. And I basically, it was the Christmas holiday, uh, it was Boxing Day. I carried on writing all through the holiday to New Year. And then I went back to work at General Electric. But now I was coming into the office at 7.30 in the morning. No, 7. I was coming into the office at 7 in the morning. And I was writing and writing until people arrived at 8.30. And I was writing all evening, late, late, late at night, and all through the weekend, just writing, writing, writing. No longer thinking about it. Instead, just writing. Because sometimes you can think too much. Think and think and think. And then just, in the end, just do it. And within seven weeks, I had a book. And you know what, it was never any work. It wasn't actually work to do it, it was at pure joy. I never enjoyed anything so much in my whole life um, as, as just writing this book. So uh, let me just read you some of it. <clears throat> so as I said, I was born in Pakistan um, and then moved to, to the UK. So this is from uh, the age of one in 1964. <clears throat> I came second in the Karachi Bonnie Baby Contest. I was wearing a black suit, white shirt, and dark tie. Smartly dressed, suave and handsome. I looked like James Bond, although I was too young to have seen either of his movies. I was also somewhat unsteady on my feet. And, and that's me there. That's it there. And although I'm standing, I don't really know how to stand or, or walk. What they've done is they've just balanced me for a second to take the photo before I fall over. first prize went to the child of the organizer. The judges were her friends. This is absolutely typical. 
of third world banana republic unfairness. In the West, the organizer's child would not be allowed to enter the contest. I was denied the title of Karachi's bonniest baby by blatant nepotism. I began my lifelong struggle against corruption and injustice. So we moved to England, and um, this is uh, the age of five, 1967. And I started school. Every day we have assembly. Every day I hear a story about Jesus, who lived a long time ago. Jesus was a very good man and told everyone to be nice to people. That seems fair to me. One day we hear the story of the prodigal son. I'm sitting on the floor with the other children listening to this. We are told that the prodigal son left his father's house to go to a faraway land because he thought that he could find a better life. Instead, he fell upon hard times, had to work as a swine herd, and was reduced to eating the same food as the pigs. I try to imagine what this must be like, but there's one thing that I don't understand. If he was herding pigs, why didn't he just eat the food from the pigs? This I know is spam, which we are fed at school. I know that eggs come from chickens and milk comes from cows, so I have logically deduced that slices of spam emerge from live pigs in the same way. This is from uh, age 6, 1968. One day at school lunch, I noticed that my classmate Stephen McNamara has an interesting way of eating spam. He cuts the slice into precise little squares. I wish that I had done the same. I look forward to the next time that we eat spam. Due to the unhealthy nature and repetition of school meals, I do not have long to wait. When I next eat spam, I remember to cut it into little squares, which is fun. I tell my parents about it in the evening. They confer together, then issue a commandment. We don't eat pork! <laughs> I am disappointed, but I obey them. From then on, I don't eat pork. I don't know why, but I don't do it. But I know that this is a wild, impossible dream for two reasons. First, no one can imagine a television program with a Pakistani man as the hero. <laughs> that will never happen. Second, as a television hero, I will probably have to kiss women on the lips. And Pakistanis don't do that. I cringe with embarrassment at what my parents would think if they saw me on the television kissing women like the saint does. So I read that passage out at the Sydney Writers' Festival and afterwards we had questions and a woman put up her hand and she said, um, why don't Pakistanis kiss on the lips? And I said, Madam, I assure you that we do. That's why there's so many of us. <sighs> Just not in public. There are no public displays of romantic affection. So she hadn't got that. She hadn't understood that. She thought that this was some other rule that Muslims have. Something that's forbidden, like uh, alcohol or some, some other forbidden thing that's taboo, that, that makes life boring. Um, but the other thing about that passage was, I knew when I was seven that I wanted to be an actor. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't an option open to me. Because um, for a child of the Indian subcontinent, very much like a child of Malaysia, um, there's only one job you can tell your parents you'd like to be that will make them really happy, which is a doctor. If you're not so bright, you could be a lawyer, an engineer, or an accountant. But actor is not even on the list of recognized occupations. And the tragedy is this. If I had indeed followed my dream, if I had uh, been in every school play that I could be, and then I'd gone to drama school and been in e every kind of production, and then if I just worked, as I just worked as a waiter or something while getting bit parts in terrible soap operas, well, I'd be living in Hollywood today. Because they are crying out for people like me to play, t to play terrorists. <laughs> so this is from the age of eight, 1970. My friend Adam Smith invites me to his house after school for tea. The house is semi-detached and has a big backyard and his mother is quite posh. She calls us inside to eat and puts a plate of sausages and beans in front of each of us. Are these pork sausages? I ask in a serious business-like manner. When Adam's mother confirms that they are, I respond automatically and somewhat abruptly in a voice indicating strong concern. 
I don't eat pork. Adam's mother is the perfect host. Oh, of course you don't. How silly of me. I'll do you some fried eggs instead. She pulls the plate away immediately. Why doesn't he eat pork, Mum? queries Adam. Oh, it's religion, dear, responds Adam's mother in a distracted way as she focuses on the frying of eggs. Oh, so that's why I don't eat pork. It's because of my religion. <laughs> and then this is from the age of 16, 1978. We are all loitering in our classroom one lunchtime. Barry Sutton suddenly asked me a question out of the blue. Hey, Imran, are your parents going to arrange your marriage? He is serious and genuinely interested. Everyone's attention is suddenly upon me. They are all interested too. Arranged marriage is something that always happens in any television program in which Indian or Pakistani characters appear. Does it apply to Imran? This is the unspeakable demon that has lurked in my mind for years. It has never been discussed overtly at home, but there has always been an implicit assumption that this will be the case. Any other process will cause a huge conflagration in my family. I imagine being asked as a grown-up, where did you meet your wife? And having to answer, at our wedding. <laughs> I can't bear to think about it. I want to be like James Bond or Simon Templar. They don't have arranged marriages. No, of course not, I tell the class with forced joviality. Anyway, so that, um, let me sit down for a moment now. So the story proceeds in that kind of vein for about 25 years. Um, so I wrote the book and uh, I wondered if it was any good. So I sent it, uh, the manuscript to friends of mine in America, in Australia, in the UK, and they all said it was great. So I, uh, I thought it might be worth trying to get it published. And I went about trying to get it published. To get published, you need to find a literary agent. You don't actually deal with the publishers directly. You get a literary agent, and they then get you a publisher. That's how it works. So I wrote to various literary agents and um, waited to get a reply. And um, I was now taking, still taking the 7.05, the five minutes past seven, train from my local station towards London Waterloo every morning but now I was, and I was looking at my fellow grey suited sombre faced commuters and I was thinking well this summer they're going to be reading my book and laughing and I imagine what I'd do with all the money I'd get from the book and, and I imagine being on a there's a television program on BBC One called The Heaven and Earth Show. I imagine being on The Heaven and Earth Show and I imagine being on BBC Radio 4 a very prestigious program called Midweek and I imagine Oprah would come into this somehow, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, as the weeks passed, I just got rejection letters from every agent I wrote to. They just weren't interested. There was just no interest at all. And this went on for a few months. And in the end, I kind of gave up on trying to get a literary agent and, and publisher. And in the end, I found that you could self-publish a book. You could, um, you could actually send it the manuscript in and pay and have it published and put on Amazon and so Sorry, no, I sent a copy to every single national newspaper. I sent a copy to every single major national newspaper and every important person I could think of and so on. And um, I also wanted to get, the, and, and I sent it to the BBC for Heaven and Earth show and I sent it to Radio 4, BBC Radio 4 to get on that. And, and I sent, uh, I also wanted to get the book into bookstores. So I found out that the head of the the, the head buyer of our biggest bookstore chain in the UK, Waterstones, is called Mr. Scott Pax. I sent him a copy as well, asked him, asking if he might read it and, and stock it in Waterstones. So the book was available on Amazon.com and Amazon UK, and I could run a sales report that was telling me how it was doing. And after about over seven weeks or so, I sold about 40 copies, which isn't bad. The tragedy was I pretty much knew all 40 of those people. Um, <laughs> Because I could run a sales report, you see, I could run the sales report and it would show me, it would not give me any names or anything, but it would just tell me the t time and date of the order and whether it was UK or US, Amazon.com or Amazon UK. And I, and I would see it and I, and I, and I, and I would know who it was because some people would say to me, oh, I ordered your book last night or I read your book last weekend and I'd look and say, oh, I know who that is, I know who that is. So over seven weeks, there were 40, 40 books had been ordered and I knew, I knew who they were. Well, one Friday evening, I was going to bed and just before I went to bed, I ran the sales report. And it showed that, in addition to the, the 40 books over seven weeks, it showed that 50 books had just sold in the last three hours in America on Amazon.com. I thought, wow, something must have happened in America and 50 people just bought it. I went to bed 
woke up on Saturday morning and I ran the sales report and it showed that in addition to the 40 books over seven weeks, 250 books had sold in the US on Amazon.com on Friday afternoon, Friday evening and Friday night. I thought, fantastic, 250 books in an evening. That is best selling. I did it. I finally did it. I am best selling. This is brilliant. I didn't need a stupid agent or a stupid publisher. I did it myself. That's fantastic. Wow. And I know what I know. It was obvious what happened. One of my friends in America must have got some publicity for the book, a local newspaper, a local television, radio or something. And 250 Americans just bought it from Amazon.com. God bless America. And I was just so, so happy. So what I did was I printed off the sales report and I marked it in red. I showed the steady sales of 40 books over seven weeks. And I drew this big red arrow in which I wrote US media event. US media event. You could tell exactly when it happened. And, um, and then I showed this, this, this surge of sales, 250 books over Friday afternoon, Friday evening and Friday night. And I wrote a covering letter to Mr. Scott Backpack, the head buyer of Waterstones, put it with the sales report. And I drove to his office on Sunday evening, Sunday night, and I gave it to the security guard, knowing that when Mr. Scott Pack sees this amazing sales report on Monday morning, he will definitely look at my book, which is in his office somewhere, in one of the piles of books. Because you know what? Everybody sends him their book. Everyone sends him their book. And his office is piled and piled with books. But when he sees this amazing sales report, he'll look at my book. On Tuesday, <clears throat> the self-publishing company emailed me to say that due to a computer error, a single order had been caught in a replicating interface loop and had just multiplied out many, many times. But not to worry, they'd fixed the problem. So I ran the sales report and the 250 orders had just disappeared. They were never real. But I didn't say anything to Mr. Scott Pack. <laughs> And one and a half weeks later, he wrote to me saying, well, thanks to this amazing sales report, he had indeed taken the trouble to find the book. And he had indeed read it. And here was his honest opinion, because he, all his policy was to give an honest opinion. He said his honest opinion was this. The book was really good. The, the manuscript, the, the content was really good. It was funny and engaging and insightful and so important. It was a really great book and people needed to read it. But he felt that the, the self-published book just looked too self-published. The physical book, the cover design, everything, it just looked too self-published and it needed a proper publisher. And he was willing to send it to a literary agent, if I would agree. So I thought about it. I thought, well, if it goes to a literary agent, that's like going backwards again. I mean, I'm already published. Why do I want to start again with a literary agent and then he has to find me a publisher? I'm already published. But then I thought, well, let's be honest though. My massive marketing campaign yielded no results whatsoever. Okay, I did get a thank you note from Cherie Blair, Tony Blair's wife, and a thank you note from Hillary Clinton, but nothing from the husbands and nothing from anyone else at all, nothing, not a glimmer, not a review, nothing. And I thought the truth is, nobody's interested in a self-published book. There's, there's, there's no interest in a self-published book. There is no shortcut, you have to get a proper published. So I said, sure, okay, send it to the literary agent. Anyway, the literary agent called me two days later, he'd read the book, he loved it, he said, Imran, I'm gonna get you a fantastic publisher for this book. Shut down the self-published book and let's go the proper way. So I, I shut down the self-published book because it was all online, you know. I could just shut, shut it down, it came off Amazon. Those books are now very rare and you can pay, I've seen them advertised for $200 actually, um, the ones which are out there. Anyway, um, so he had me um, make some additions to the manuscript um, the next Christmas holiday and then um, he said to me, when I sent him the manuscript, he said, he said, Imran, this is so funny, engaging, and stuff. this is brilliant. I mean, I'm going to sell this so easy. I'm sending it to the top 10 UK publishers. So he did that, and over the following weeks, I was still taking the 7.05 a.m. train to London Waterloo, and I was, but now I was looking at my fellow grey-suited, sombre-faced commuters, and I was thinking, this summer, they're going to be reading my book and laughing. And I'm going to, with all that money I'm going to get, I'm going to buy a convertible car. One of those where the roof, you push a button and the roof goes into the boot. A solid metal roof and you, you push a button and it goes into the boot and has a satellite navigation system, integrated satellite navigation in silver grey metallic. Anyway, as the weeks passed, he'd call me now and then he said, he would say, oh, Im Imran, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, Penguin turned it down. Oh, Imran, I'm sorry to tell you, Random House turned it down. Oh, Imran, I'm sorry to tell you, HarperCollins turned it down. And in the end, they all turned it down. So I came in to see him. I said, well, Charlie, what the hell's going on? You said that it was so funny and engaging and insightful and so on, and it was sell so easily. What's, what happened? And he said, Imran, this is what they said. They said he wasn't miserable enough. 
there was no sexual abuse, there was no terrorism angle. You didn't become a terrorist, not even an Islamist. There's too much discussion about religion, there's no angle. Uh, I, I said, but, but, that's, but that's me, that's life, normal life, you see. And he said, but no, he said they're actually looking for a book by someone who became, well, if not a terrorist, at least an Islamist. I mean, was that not you? I said, no, that's not me. Um, and this is the problem, actually. The people who control the media, the people who control the output of what people see, they decide what people get to see. So basically, an, uh, the book, a book about an ordinary Muslim boy growing up who never becomes a terrorist and Islamist and whatever and so on, that's not what they want to put out there. They're looking for, always for an angle, the kind of angle that makes people angry, afraid and so on. And that's, the, uh, that's all the data that people get. So anyway, that's fine. Um, he then said, well, I'll send it to some other publishers. And he did that. And in the end, we, we got an offer from a smaller publisher. Um, smaller publisher, and, uh, but they, they, they did publish the book. So that, that was great. Now, about the, the massive advance that I was um, supposed to receive, I'm not going to tell you how much that was because that is, um, that's a private matter. But I will tell you that I've seen second-hand bicycles that cost more money. But anyway, but the, the week that the book came out, I, I was on the Heaven and Earth show on BBC television and I was on BBC Radio for midweek. So that all came about. Um, and then, it, although it took me another five years to get to US publication because the Americans also were just not interested in a book about a normal boy, Muslim boy who be doesn't become a terrorist or an Islamist and so on. But five years later, I got to US publication. Though they changed the name. They changed it from Unimagined to The Perfect Gentleman. And when it came out, it was endorsed by Oprah. It was in her magazine as the number one book to buy um, that month. And, uh, and so, the, so Oprah came into picture. So it all came true in the end. Anyway, <clears throat> when my book came out in the UK, and it had wonderful reviews, and it was the best books of the year, it had wonderful reviews and so on, and, um, and people said it was a very important book. They said it was a politically important book. So I decided to send a copy to every single member of parliament, of whom there are 646. If you consider that it takes four minutes to inscribe and sign a book, fold the covering letter, put the covering letter in the book, close the book, put that book in an envelope, seal the envelope, put that on a pile. Four minutes times 646 equals 42 hours. That does not include the time that you spend surfing the internet and staring out the window. That's all extra. So 42 hours it would take, plus, 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 to do this. So I did it over three weekends going through the list of MPs, members of parliament in alphabetical order. So the first weekend I was at the beginning of the list, the second weekend I was in the middle, and the third weekend I was near the end. So I got to W, and I came upon a particular name. And when I saw the name of that MP, I thought, I cannot stand that woman. I'm always seeing her on the television, and she's absolutely miserable. It was one Anne Widdicombe MP. And she was always presented as a very conservative Christian, really conservative Christian, the kind that makes you feel, it's not all peace and love, but the kind that makes you feel you're doing something wrong, wrong, wrong. And she always came across very miserable. When I saw her on the television, they were presenting her as very miserable. And I thought, well, if she's a very conservative Christian, that means she's a miserable old dragon. And if she's a miserable old dragon, then she's never going to read a, my book, A Muslim Boy Meets the West. Uh, oh, I'm wasting my time and my money sending that miserable woman my book. Um, I'm, I'm wasting my time and money. Cause, oh, by the way, when I say my money, I mean because you don't get the books for free. Just because you wrote the book, you don't get it for free. You do have to pay the publisher for the book. Not full retail, but still. I thought, I'm wasting my time and my money sending that miserable woman my book. And then I thought, I know what I can do. I can send it to 645 MPs, but I can say that I sent it to 646 and nobody will ever know. But in the end, I just thought, oh, what the hell? I, and I inscribed a book to her, dear Anne, blah, 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 best wishes. And never had best wishes been conveyed so sullenly and insincerely as I, as I conveyed them. And I closed and I folded the letter and put it in, closed it, put it in the envelope, put it on the pile and to hell with it. So, I finished the uh, 646 books and I loaded them into my car, my big black Honda car, and I drove to the House of Commons. <clears throat> now, the policeman at the gate, he wasn't that happy to see a Middle Eastern looking man driving up in a car with 646 letter bomb sized packages, <laughs> each one addressed to a different member of parliament. It did not make his day at all. 
but anyway, he, he actually he called someone out. They actually have a belt there, the scanner, a security scanner with a belt, and he called someone out and they helped me get the books out of my car and onto the belt and through the scanner, and that was that. That was sorted. So the job was done. <clears throat> so I went home. So from the very next day, and for several weeks, I received literally hundreds of letters from members of parliament, all thanking me for the book. Some of them even saying that they'd read it. Um, I even had a wonderful letter from David Cameron, the leader of the opposition, who wrote, he actually wrote that um, I could, he really enjoyed it, and I could write speeches, he hand wrote at the bottom, that I could write speeches for him. But now that he's prime minister, he doesn't return my calls, he doesn't answer my emails, return, respond to my letters or anything. But of course, there was nothing from Anne Widdicombe MP, but what would you expect from that miserable woman? The most wonderful things happened. I was invited to the Edinburgh International Book Festival by Catherine Lockerbie, who read, um, who read my book. And I went up there and they gave me a badge that said I was a writer. And it let me into the writer's tent. They call it the writer's year. This is huge tent, which has carpets and sofas and free food and drink. And there were all these famous writers in there. And they thought I was a writer as well. And my event went fantastically. I had a most wonderful time. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, so the last, and I thought, I thought, wow, this is what I ever dreamed of. You know, away from, not in the office. I'm a writer in a writer's festival. It doesn't get any better than that. The last evening I was there, it was pouring with rain. It was dark and pouring with rain, and there was nobody in the writer's tent except myself and this beautiful woman who was sitting there writing in her personal organiser. So I thought, well, it's worth a shot. So I said to her, terrible weather we're having, and she agreed that we were having terrible weather. And then um, I said to her, so are you a writer as well? And she said in a very tired voice, no, I'm Wendy Weir, I'm the director of the Sydney Writers' Festival. And the reason it was a very tired voice was that I did exactly what she knew what would happen. I then gave her a pitch, two minutes, and what a brilliant book I'd written. And um, she was really tired, she just wasn't bothered to hear, hear it, but uh, she did give me her business card. So I mailed her a copy of the book down to Australia. And this was in August when I met her, and I didn't hear from her until February, and her, her festival was in, was in May, coming up. I came into the office one February morning, and there was an email from her. It said, Dear Imran, I finally found the time to read your book this weekend, and I would like to invite you to the Sydney Writers' Festival. So I ended up going to the Sydney Writers' Festival, and they gave me a badge that said I was a writer. And, and they let me into the writers' area, and there were all these famous writers there, and they thought I was a writer as well. And I had the most fantastic time, and my event went brilliantly, and people laughed and laughed. I made these great friends, and it was just wonderful. I got an Australian publisher, it was fantastic. Um, and there was a beautiful woman standing there, so I thought, well, it's worth a shot. So I started talking to her, and she said her name was Janet, and she was a director of the Ubud Writers' Festival in Bali. So I gave Janet a copy of my book. And I returned to London after the festival. And two days later, I had an email from Janet inviting me to her festival in Bali. So I ended up going to, I ended up going to Bali, Ilbud, and um, they put me in the Four Seasons Hotel with all these famous writers. And, and, and all these famous writers, they thought I was a writer as well. I had the most fantastic time. The audience laughed. It was absolutely wonderful. And while I was there, Catherine invited me to, to her festival in Perth. And... Um, which I went to, and uh, Jenny invited me to her festival in Byron Bay, Australia, where my book was the number one bestseller. And then um, Jenny met Isabel in Melbourne, Isabel from Dubai in Melbourne, and then Isabel invited me to the Emirates Airlines Festival of Literature in Dubai, uh, where I had a, a wonderful time, the same whole story, put me in a fantastic hotel, I met all these famous writers, and then the I was a writer and so on. You know, curiously, I've ne and, then, and then just, Last year, I was invited to Chicago. So, so it, just, it just goes on and on. Curiously, I've never been invited to a literary festival where the director was a man. Can't understand that. Anyway, anyway so the most wonderful things have unfolded. So I, I have to tell you, I never did get the huge advance and the convertible cars, but I've had the most wonderful experiences. It's been absolutely extraordinary. So anyway, I got in the habit of um, Googling myself every night. And... Um, one day I googled myself and found that my book was listed in the Guardian newspaper in the best books of the year. Another time I googled myself and found it was listed in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald in the, in the uh, pick of the literary crop. Another time I googled myself and found this picture. And um, who is this? 
it's Julia Gillard, it's Julia Gillard, Prime Minister of Australia. And the article was about her office. And you can see in her office she has some personal photos, some frame prints, um, some law books, and then the, these books along here. Yeah. These books here. And the article actually talked about what those books were and it listed them. So it listed them specifically and my one was the first one that they mentioned. So that was that was absolutely extraordinary. But the biggest surprise of all came, right, the biggest surprise of all came when I Googled myself one day and found that my book was listed in the independent newspaper in the best books of the year. Thanks to its selection by one of the judges who wrote that it was my favorite book of the year. One, Anne Whittaker MP. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed that I totally misjudged that decent, kind, warm-hearted woman that, that um, you see, I, I'd seen her on the television and they presented her as really miserable, miserable, miserable. And I just assumed that was true. I mean, I just took that as how she was and I'd never met her before or anything, but I just accepted how she was presented and I made assumptions about how she would feel about my book, that she wouldn't even read it or whatever and she'd be hostile. I made these assumptions and I was completely wrong. So I wrote her a thank you letter, but I didn't tell her any of the stuff I told you. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, what a hypocrite this made me. Because here I was saying to people, listen, don't judge Muslims by what you see on the television. That's not fair. That's not representative. But I had done exactly the same thing to Anne Widdicombe. I had seen her on the television presented in a very negative way. And I just assumed that was real, true. I just took that as true. I made a judgment about her, I made assumptions about her, and I was completely wrong. So now I try and live by a principle that her boss would uh, advocate, not David Cameron, but her big boss, which is judge not lest you be judged. And that's what I try and do. So we try, should go through life not making assumptions about other people and, and, and try not to judge and so on. And that's pretty much the end of my story. Thank you very much. I personally would like to thank you for your time for being here. It's a pleasure personally to meet you. You know, these kind of books might save some people's life like me. I'm, uh, I'm married to a British girl. Right now she's pregnant. She's in UK, so I couldn't go because of security reasons. Oh, it's terrible. And I was rejected for a job in UK. I passed all the interviews and I was rejected because of security clearance. Oh. So it's good to see some people like you are putting effort to solve this kind of problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about your experience. Like I said, the the, the media and so on filters the information that people get so that they only see this perspective, a very tiny perspective. And the, some people in, especially America, have just no idea of the ordinariness of Muslims, the, the concept of Muslims being ordinary. And of course, you know, every time something happens like this Boston bombing, again, it, it just reinforces that issue about Muslims. But they, ne they never see the bigger picture, which is that most vast majority of Muslims are just recognizably human, just normal human people, just like themselves. And that's something I tried to uh, demonstrate with, with the book. And of course I had so much trouble getting it published because there was no angle, no angle terrorism, fanaticism and so on, but I got there in the end. Um, but we also, we also can do the same thing, we all do it, we can all make judgments about people based on the, the information we receive when we don't know anything about them, don't know them personally. So I, I'm now trying to be very careful about what judgment I make based on what I see on the television about any, any group at all. And I'm sorry about your experience, but we all... You know, uh, my wife is delivering. Oh no, really? Next two weeks, so imagine you're a father. <laughs> She's British, originally British. Right. 
grandfather British, so uh -huh. my only mistake is that I look like James Bond or something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear that, but I hope everything goes well. Thank you. Imran, with all the hassle of, of getting published, um, would you be writing again? Would it worth doing it again? Oh, it's definitely worth it. Um, because of the experiences I had since writing the book, I mean, it's just been fantastic. Like I say, you know, going to Edinburgh and Sydney and Bali and Perth and Byron Bay and Dubai and Chicago, that was all fantastic. And, oh, but, but it, I had to come to Malaysia before it finally happened. <laughs> finally, finally happened. It was in Malaysia only this January. It never happened before. I was sitting in the waiting room of Glen Eagles Medical Center X-ray department for my routine medical chest X-ray. And a Malaysian woman came up to me and said, excuse me, are you the writer of that book? The that was, it never happened before. <laughs> and, it, and then, two months later, I was walking through KLCC Surya uh, Mall and a, and a Malaysian woman comes up to me and says, Excuse me, are you in Manama, the writer of the Pepper Chamber? So it's happened twice. <laughs> it, it never it. happened before. <laughs> Thank you for coming to uh, Yim today and share your experiences, your book. You are so inspiring. I now feel like writing a book myself. <laughs> oh, just someone it. like me, who don't really look like a Muslim, but totally a Muslim. <laughs> and even though knowing that spam, even if you cut it precisely in small pieces, you don't need it. No. <laughs> Actually, you shouldn't eat it for health reasons. Don't mind religion. Yeah. You shouldn't eat it for health reasons. In fact, they don't really serve it in school anymore anyway. It's yeah. so unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, actually, we were worried too, you know, <laughs> because uh, you know, uh, you know, they, they have this data that shows that Malaysian only read like about uh, one page uh, uh, a year or one pa or one book a year or something like that. So to be to have this kind of uh, interaction and be talking about books and to get people interested in it, um, I think it's, it's 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 a great achievement in a way. So we were so worried initially as well. Uh, but anyway, I think it's, it's a great clap to everyone at that time. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Okay, uh, yes, yes, one Actually, I didn't know you earlier, so I got to know you from them, and I bought the book, oh. and I read your book. Oh. And I'm actually here wondering whether you have another book that I can buy. But unfortunately, no. There, is, there, there will be a sequel, but it's not out yet. Cause I, still, <laughs> I still have to do my day job. And in fact, even this afternoon, they'll be wondering, hey, I haven't seen him around. Where is he? <laughs> I just I sneaked out the office. To... Yes. One more. Um, Hi. Have you thought about incorporating your ideas into educational systems? Because, um, because... You know, so many, thank you. So many people have said that they think the book would make a great textbook, set text, because and it's a clean book, you know, there's no bad language. And, and nothing really happens in, you know what, <laughs> nothing really happens. And um, it's quite a clean book for say, uh, 30, 12 to 13, 12, 13 plus. Um, so many people said that, it's a, oh, because actually the memoir, it's just a vehicle for many discussions. There are many serious discussions in the book about religion, philosophy, uh, sociology, uh, modern history, foreign policy, and so on. It's all woven into the narrative uh, as the, the narrator thinks about these things and learns about these things as he, grow, as he grows up. So there's a lot of serious discussion, but it's all woven into a, a story. And um, many people have said that they wish that there would be a set text in school. In fact, in some schools, Manchester Grammar School, it, it, it was on the, the curriculum and also a college in America and, and a university in, uh, in the UK as well. In fact, I, was, I, I, addressed the, I addressed the students, the English language students at this university because the book was on their, um, it was a set text on their core course for English literature. And I was the only writer on the list who wasn't dead. So that's why they had me come to do the, the talk. Anyway, um, so yes, thank you. I would really like to, I've given talks at schools and so on. Uh, yes, and Inovasi is, is running this campaign uh, entitled The Future We Desire. Okay, so people, my people will go around and have you write your desire for the future and we snap a photo of you. This photo will be used 
for our World Innovation uh, Forum Kuala Lumpur in November. Will be part of our uh, uh, the, to support the theme then. Okay, so if you are please stick around. Okay, enjoy the food we're serving here, and probably you can line up uh, if you want to buy books and get uh, uh, Imran to sign. All right, again, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and please uh, remember, uh, we have your email. Uh, we will send more invite for the future event. Yeah, it's happening. Hey, Tarik Talk. Yes, I do Malaysia every second Friday of the month. Thank you so much. I think the talk is very interesting that you bring in people um, to give their opinion. And there's a lot of audience here. But I wish next time when you have it, make sure that uh, you give a bit more exposure and bring um, people who are willing to come and listen you know, to what people have to say. Great, great talk, great session here. Today was my pleasure to attend this speech by Mr. Imran Ahmed about the book, The Perfect Gentleman. I like this book because this book is trying to bring the people closer. It's not only bringing the people closer, it's also bringing people, people like me who are having family closer. I'm happy, I like this book because this book might change the, the perception of many people about Muslim people, like a, peop, like a person like me, who, who has a family, who has, a, who has even a British wife, that even it's very difficult for me to enter the country. I hope this kind of book, this kind of speech, make the world united and have the world in one piece. Tea Tariq Talk. Bye.